The alt-right is generating a political discourse that has been edging its way toward the mainstream with frightening effect. Not merely is it pushing a parameter of the Overton window, but it is coming also to define its center. This in turn is coming to define what is meant by the left, in a way that is effectively excluding it from the Overton parameters, despite the left being historically associated with the impulses within the populist field that the alt-right are using to their own advantage. In Doug Lane's YouTube video for Zero Books published on 22nd of March 2019 entitled Is Postmodernism Conservative? The left may have a springboard from which it might aspire to reclaim those populist impulses. In the alt-right's discourse, the term postmodernism often describes an intellectual movement in the academy supposedly bent on dissolving traditional normativity that once bonded our society together. However, arguably, postmodernism is an observable phenomenon resulting from a complex confluence of factors relating largely to the marketization of social relations. The intellectual postmodern theorists the alt-right refer to merely theorize this observation rather than encourage its progress. Though to be fair, this does provide a language for understanding these processes, causing reflexive awareness that might accelerate such developments. It is absurd, however, to believe they invented it for the adoption by an emergent left. As is the case with much social critique made by the alt-right, in theorizing about postmodernism, it is guilty of the very thing it criticizes. If we recognize this emergent left the alt-right call SJWs or snowflakes, we must also recognize their ideological counterparts on the identitarian right. Both appropriate traditional politics in a way novel to the 21st century. We might more accurately recognize their political inclinations to be rooted in the center rather than the left or right. And if we were to imagine the space between left and right not as a straight line, but as an arc, if we were to draw a spike downward from the center, signifying an intensification of that center, and drawing it down toward its opposing inverse arc below, we might identify their politics as constituting a new radical centrism or a hyperliberalism. Arguably, neoliberalism represented a radical centrism, but it managed to constitute the status quo without the same radical breaks many on the identitarian left and right stand for, and we are seeing, in the wake of 2008, a burgeoning post-neoliberalism and a political space occupied by hyper-liberal centrists with radical anti-status quo politics. This more holistic theory of postmodernism, focusing on the emergent nature of politics, leaves it far from the conscious application of any one philosophy. Though, while the alt-rights claim to root the generation of postmodernism at the hands of particular leftist intellectuals is absurd, it is correct to conceive of it as causing the social dissolution we are currently experiencing. Stemming from this recognition is the argument regarding the efficacy of collective political subjectivities in today's politics. It is extremely difficult to conceive of collective political subjectivities the likes of which we saw during the 20th century and before, forming today. Many argue that attempting to construct such is futile and we should accept the individualist nature of hyperliberalism and focus on the intersectionality of personal subjectivities. To illustrate this, in identifying the 1%, many attempted to construct a universal, a new class-based collective subjectivity that aimed at overturning the gross inequalities and the effective return of the Victorian standard, a social hierarchy of extreme wealth focused in the hands of the very few, nullifying democratic processes and institutions. The 99% here are identified not by the self, but by the subjugation of power, by the 1%. However, since the concept spike and subsequent collapse in line with the rise and fall of the Occupy movement, the new identity politics of hyperliberalism has rose to prominence. This is manifesting on the left in fractured, self-identifying individual subjectivities and on the right in collective subjectivities shaped by fictitious holders of power such as deep state conspiracy theories, Muslims, immigrants, Jews and the left. In Is Postmodernism Conservative? Lane's point about postmodernism's two constitutive strands, reaction and resistance, both being conservative is somewhat counterintuitive to how we conceive of resistance and rebellion. Lane claims that in reducing a critique of capitalism to resistance, postmodernism both assists and acts out a reactionary core. That is, mere resistance to capitalism without an alternative vision or practice amounts to little more than a reaction, an inevitable mere rebound within the parameters of the superstructure. 
Looking at the manifestations of resistance over the past century, we see that its cultural peaks have largely been self-undermining rebellions based primarily in liberal philosophy, dabbling perhaps in socialism for a sense of edginess or adventurism. In Kill All Normies, Angela Nagel argues that the draw of the alt-right evidences the very same pattern, only that socialism has lost its edge this time to fascism. Nagel charts the liberalist rebellion of transgression from the beatniks through to hippies, hipsters, and what we are now witnessing. Cool was always an essential dimension to this pattern, from John Wayne through the rebel without a cause to Bart Simpson and any given character played by Eddie Furlong, rebellion has been iconized in American culture by the lone gunman against the world. Cool, dispassionate, isolated, rebellion in mid to late capitalism always seem to enforce the necessary individual character of the very promise of capitalism. Perhaps a cultural trope created to provide a containment unit with which the modern would-be dissident could inject and hold their impulses against the system, affording them the sense of rebellion while enforcing the social conditions best suited to that system's continued existence. Ironically, this trope teaches the idea that groups of workers struggling to provide for their families, a counter trope, the sort of group that possesses the potential to unionize and form platforms for collective bargaining and mount an actual challenge to those that defend capitalism, were the enemy, the point of which we were to identify against. In working class dads and team players, American culture painted its white picket fenced potential for a post war reemergence of socialist resistance as something utterly antithetical to the burgeoning rebel subjectivities. And now, the social democracy, constituted by so many gains made by pre war socialist revolutionary groups, is lost, and with it, that cultural potentiality for authentic socialist rebellion. Instead, Lane is claiming, we are left with the social incapacity to self organize to form genuine social networks of resistance or collective subjectivities. We have in its place a postmodern social ensemble of intersectional, self-identifying, hyper-liberal individual subjectivities thrill in, along with advertisements of many megacorporations, what amounts to meaningless transgression. Resistance against capitalism through a postmodern philosophical lens leaves us merely reacting against false frontiers, believing in a social situation where modernism is a dead project something we can no longer reignite. And with its death, so too is the possibility of forming authentic social bonds, or transcending individual identities to form collective subjectivities, to reintroduce passion, connection and anger to the sort of resistance against capitalism that in modern times came to rock its very foundation. This is the significance Lane attributes to Habermas's claim that modernity is an incomplete project. Neoliberal politics, initiated by Thatcher and Reagan and sustained by their supposed opposition in Blair and Clinton, eroded vehemently the common conception of the political. Under this new consensus, the term politics became a dirty word, as it insinuated the wasteful Cold War opposition between state and market, a conflict won out supposedly by the efficiency of markets to assemble material resources in the competitive ideological conditions of the post-war 20th century. With the fall of the USSR, politics, the tension between left and right, was no longer needed. A third way came to be, the rise of the centre, and capitalism with a smile. This third way declared that the old argument between left and right could now be discarded for an on-time, pragmatic approach to socio-economic solutions. This new emergent field allowed the critical urge to imbue itself, as above, in terms of identity expression, in an accelerated social dissolution as collective subjectivities gave way to infinitely fracturing personalized self-conceptions. However, during the history of our current paradigm, a small number of people aggrieved of by the real politic that continued unchallenged by those happy to indulge their new selves in their post-political context attacked the US, revisiting both the misery of American involvement in the Middle East and the political back on American people. Since then, the pathway back to the political has taken novel directions. As above, the hyper-liberal millennial generation are picking up fragments from the shattered mantle of 20th century politics, reassembling the political in ways unrecognizable to orthodox political analysis. Lane recalls an argument made by Frederick Jameson that we are left to accept one of two things. The first is to accept the narrative that in modernity the human subject once existed, but in post-modernity we have lost this capacity, we are post-human. In this situation, Habermas's argument comes to life. The politics of our post-human situation fails to deal with the economic or social causes of its own state. 
Instead, it circulates between the neoconservative critique of social dissonance, such as the breakdown of traditional values, and the radical postmodernist critique blaming those traditional values and institutions for institutionalized racism, sexism, and homophobia. This circular inclination is the material basis for the cultural point made by Lane throughout the rest of the video, illustrated by Jameson's point concerning nostalgia. That nostalgia is colonizing fresh cultural products signifies our inability to focus on our own present and reproduce it aesthetically. For Lane, the film Slacker represented a piece of cultural production that focused on and accurately portrayed its contemporary moment. Lane argues that in postmodernity we appear to be unable to do this. New technology only ever seems to be applied to the recycling of what once was. We appear trapped in a cultural loop, unable to push forward, to push the moment forward, to envision the future and make an attempt to reach for it. If we are forever reaching backward for authenticity, with the sense that what is directly at our feet is somehow unreal or inauthentic, then we shall remain in this stasis, remain in the circular politics of postmodernity. The alternative Jameson proposes then, is to not only promote the recognition of the ideology of capitalist realism, helping undo the impression generated under conservative postmodernism that the human subject is no more, but also to recognize that even if this were not indeed the case, that the concept of the human subject was a bourgeois myth fed to people to accept the conditions of capitalist modernity. In understanding this and the ideology of capitalist realism, we might escape the cultural stasis and conceive of an art and critique movement that focuses desperately on the now, representing culturally the aesthetic aspect of now, allowing us a momentary glimpse at an actually existing collective subjectivity we are currently perhaps unable to comprehend. A community that once realized may attempt to make progress toward individuality and autonomy conceived democratically and within our techno-natural means, amounting to a radical break with our current conception of both the self and the collective. There is a collective out there. Humanity exists in a collective sense, and we have shared experiences and common unmet demands. However, under postmodernity, culturally, Mediated interventions apprehend our ability to conceive of this, our fragmented identities sliding us further toward that hyper-liberal position. Without appealing to the modern conception of the self, some previous state of being that fostered the generation of social movements based on the human subject, we might seek to go beyond this conception also, to conceive of a state of being based on nothing but that which we might glimpse through the cultural reproduction of now. When Lane reflects Matt McManus's argument that postmodernity is a philosophy born out of stasis, he means it is the reflexive conception of that stasis, the feed-out loop generated by mass culture of late capitalism and the supposed age of information. When he claims modernity is an unfinished project, he is suggesting we can make renewed attempts at being human. Understanding capitalist realism as an ideology may help erase the notion that where we are historically is some inevitable determination, but rather a point where the record skips back some seconds over and over. Recognizing capitalist realism might equip us with the ability to know how to nudge the needle past that point and continue on. When Lane ends by noting that, in theory at least, we have already surpassed whatever post-human subjectivity existed under capitalist realism, in his vagueness, he is begging for a new discourse to fill that void.